<laughs> Join the club. <laughs> yeah, we just sunk a bunch into a new greenhouse. I will call the special meeting of the Board of Aldermen to order at 710. Uh, the prayer will be offered by City Clerk Patricia Piazzu and Alderman Lopez will lead us in the pledge to the flag. Almighty God, we have the high honor and serious duty to manage the affairs of our beloved city. Fill us, O oh God, with a spirit of unity and understanding, which enables us to face our multiple problems with a serene mind with justice and charity for all, so that any and all decisions made by us will always be for the betterment and greater happiness of all our fellow citizens. So help us God. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would the clerk please call a roll? Alderman Wilshire. Here. Alderman Clemens. Alderman Tenza. Here. Alderman Cookson. Alderman Dowd. Present. Alderman Karen. Alderman Siegel. Alderman Shuneman. Alderwoman Melisi Gola. Present. Alderman McGinnis. Alderman LeBrun. Here. Alderman Moriarty. Alderman O'Brien. Present. Alderman Lopez. Here. Alderman McCarthy. Present. We have eight members present. Also present, uh, Corporation Counsel Stephen Bolton. Uh, the mayor is unable to attend this evening. He has family in town. He has an obligation there, so he will not be joining us. Um, communications? Alderman Wilshire. Motion is that communications be read by title only. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Communication from Brian S. McCarthy, President, Board of Aldermen, relative to Special Board of Aldermen meeting. Alderman Wilshire. Move to accept and place on file. Motion is to accept the communication and place it on file. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. This evening, the sole item on the agenda is a discussion with the uh, Nashua delegation uh, to the state legislature. Uh, I want to keep it fairly uh, free form, so um, it might be a good idea if we just go around and everybody uh, introduce themselves, and uh, if you're a state rep or a senator and you're involved with specific legislative things, uh, that we might be interested in. Tell us about those. If you're an alderman um, or an alderman elect, uh, talk about what things you might want to talk about, and we'll see where the discussion goes from there. <laughs> alderman Lopez, you want to start? Yep. My name is Tom Lopez. Um, my specific priorities at alderman are infrastructure, um, road repavement, sidewalk uh, repair, um, public transportation, and then um, we also have a, a continuing need for uh, low-income housing or fixed-income housing, particularly for the elderly here in Nashville. I'm Representative Allison Nutting from Ward 7. I'm Representative Mary Ellen McKay. I'm from Ward 7, and I filed legislation this year to repeal 155-D with the assistance of the Nashua Building Inspector and with um, the BCRB, the Building Code Review Board. And the reason I filed it is because it's a moot point. New Hampshire started that legislation before we um, all adopted the International Energy Conservation Code. And so because of that reason, we filed it. I sit on HHS, and um, I guess that's it. Oh, one piece of legislation, my guardianship for grandparents, the preference on that one. Um, because we were first in the country to introduce it, I'm going to Nashville the beginning of December to um, introduce that legislation as model legislation for the country. Don LeBrun, uh, representative uh, from Ward 5, and I have uh, five pieces of legislation I've filed that are pertinent to uh, Nashua. 
the first one is uh, based on the state uh, building code. Uh, I have one on exploitation of uh, the elderly and disabled. Another one I have is uh, enabling the Department of Health and Human Services to enter into a contract with an academy society for addiction medicine. Also, I have one on uh, food service inspections, uh, inspections of restaurants and uh, food service purveyors. And the last one I have is relative to pharmacy interns and vaccinations. Uh, in the past, I have had legislation uh, passed to enable pharmacies to give the uh, pneumococcal uh, vaccine, the Zostervax and such, and this is just a continuation of that. Thank you. Hello, I'm um, Alderwoman Mar Marianne Melissi Golia, and I represent Ward 8. Um, in terms of priorities for the city, um, I chair planning and economic development and certainly feel both sides of that are important. On the economic development side, um, I've began conversations during the summer with um, the National Regional Planning Commission, NRPC, about looking at the economic impact of the arts within our region, within the region covered by NRPC. And that conversation is actually going to move forward next month um, with members of the arts community here in Nashua. So we're, we're really trying to look at what exactly does the arts bring to our community and what can we do to better position the Nashua region within the state as well as any um, supports that, that may be needed. Um, within economic development also looking at what's happening in the city and looking at housing and workforce housing. Um, looking at people who are coming in and maybe um, entering our community <coughs> with college degrees, but um, entering their profession at the beginning in a lower level job and looking at what they can afford to pay and what we have available for them in terms of rentals or even properties to purchase. So they're able to both live and work in the same community and stay here and grow their families. Um, as we look at trying to bring young families in, affordability of housing is one of the things we, we need to look at. Um, as a past school board member, I am always interested in what's going on to support families and children, birth through adult, and looking at funding for our schools and how they're being supported. Thank you. I'm Rick Dowd, I'm the alderman from Ward 2. And as chair of budget, I have two things of concern. One is I'm looking forward to the kindergarten funding coming down from the state. And the other is I'd like to find out from the delegates, uh, are there any unexpected bills that we might get in the next budget season? Oh, may I just say something? Excuse Alderman McCarthy. Sure. Um, it, some of you I know were at the, um, the um, meeting for the 10 year transportation plan and I think you heard us discuss the pedestrian and vehicular traffic situation in South Nashua so looking at funds there um, and what we can do to assist with the congestion around exit 1 Spitbrook Road Daniel Webster Highway um, as many of you know, we have a very high concentration of citizens who live in that area as well as businesses that are developing there. So um, we have concerns about both foot traffic and um, getting cars in and out of the area. So looking at where the 10-year plan is going, um, we have one item on the plan that addresses the pedestrian issues and the other item that we spoke to that evening, which is not on the plan, but is a concern about getting traffic in and out of the Flatley property. Thank you. I'm uh, Marty Jack. I'm uh, representing Ward 9, and uh, I sit on Public Works and Highways. Uh, the three main areas that I work on are 
uh, infrastructure. That means roads, bridges, and rail. And I appreciate the uh, alderman bringing up the item on the 10-year plan. We'll be getting that shortly, and I'll make sure I keep my eye on that. Uh, the other is public education. Uh, in the context of, of uh, where I sit on the committee, that primarily means making sure that the community colleges get money that they need to start up programs. The community colleges are a wonderful bang for the buck in terms of getting people educated, keeping them in the state, and, and getting them jobs. Uh, and then the third is health care. That means uh, getting as many people onto health insurance as possible. Uh, Representative LeBrun uh, didn't mention House Bill 124, which is held over from last yeah, year. Well. And uh, <laughs> that, uh, thank you. And uh, that, I'm, I'm pleased to report, came out of the Ways and Means Committee with a 22 to 1 ought to pass as amended. Uh, and that will be taken up on the first Wednesday in January. <coughs> and that's the reduction of aircraft registration? Yes, bill? that's the aircraft registration bill. Or our loan success story from last. No, now I don't have to mention it. <laughs> yeah, our pension bills didn't do so well. <laughs> we tried. Hi, um, I'm considered board of Alderman Elect, and um, I'm here to listen and hear what the state and the city has to say. Hi, I'm Representative Jan Schmidt from Ward 1, and my committee up in Concord is Labor. Um, I have quite a few bills in with my name on them, but I don't think anything is going to uh, impact the city itself. Um, although I have looked through most of the bills that have uh, been flipped, um, there are some really interesting bills there that are going to uh, affect the city. And I'd, I'd really like to work with, uh, with everyone here to make sure that they don't impact us in a, in a bad manner. Um, other than that, um, thank you for holding this tonight. You got it. Oh, sorry. I'm uh, State Rep from uh, Nashua Ward 8, Lata Manjipudi, and um, my focus, so one, I'm really excited to say that one of the bills that, uh, first bill that I ever introduced by myself and it passed, that was the Rotary um, license plate and it's a uh, special kind of plate that has a decal on it and Rotary um, District 7870 was the first one to get the decal approved, so it's in, in law, so it's a special plate, and uh, they would get, the Rotary would get the, the state gets all the funding, the extra $15 that uh, people have to pay to get that special license plate, and they put the decal on it. So there's added, it's specialty plate. So I'm happy about that. And my other focus has been local in terms of um, culture and art exchange. And uh, uh, last year, when after the Sister City initiative passed, several of the, um, there were five people that went from Nashua to Mysore. And uh, there was a team that came from uh, India on integrative medicine and yoga. And uh, the Indian government had uh, has shown great deal of interest in starting a center for excellence here in Nashua, and uh, which means the partnership, and I'm trying to figure out who's going to put the first dollar down, and so I'm not going anywhere. I'm going <laughs> to stay here and fight for that, not make, work hard to make that happen, and especially the focus is on heal the hurt for the uh, problem pain management and substance use disorder population to build resiliency and sustainable um, cost-effective alternative in building the mental health and um, resiliency. And the other uh, same uh, area, increasing the youth mental health and well-being and resiliency in schools. Uh, I've been talking with the superintendent and also um, 
again, Mysore Yoga Center and uh, Nimhans is very in, uh, National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences in uh, Mysore is very interested in having a collaborative um, work and this is in the works. So a lot of work, a lot of phone calls, a lot of um, driving around. Thank you. Hi, I'm Laurie Wilshire. I chair the Human Affairs Committee. Um, I think my focus over the last 18 years on the board has been to work to help the nonprofits in the city provide services to those at risk in our community. Um, I also am the liaison to the police department. I'd like to make sure that our streets are safe and that we continue to support the, the needs of our public service, the police, fire, um, especially with the opioid em epidemic out there. And uh, you know, it, it's, our, our community has really stepped up and done some really great things. So pretty much it. Brian McCarthy, the president of the board. I think a lot of my focus, at least with respect to discussions with the state, have been on the general um, financial well-being of the city and things like the retirement system, uh, as well as issues around economic development, um, such as the aircraft registration fee change, which I think is, is very beneficial to Nashua in particular. Um, and beyond that, I uh, spend a lot of time on planning issues and uh, budget, et cetera. Betty? Hello. Hi, I'm uh, State Senator Betty Lasky, and I am Vice Chair of the Judiciary Committee and serve on the Commerce Committee. Um, I will be prime sponsor. Our bills in, from the Senate have we've not ha yet had to sign off on them, so they are still in somewhat of a state of flux. Uh, but I will be doing a couple of um, election law. Our city clerk will be happy to hear that. Um, one is n about not sharing information, such as the fiasco we had with our Secretary of State this summer. Um, the other would be closing a loophole for uh, s campaign finance uh, from uh, spending general election funds in a primary, which was done by the soon-to-be former mayor of Manchester. Um, I believe I'm prime on another one, and I will be doing uh, many co-sponsoring. Um, I know one, we hope to have the repeal of the death penalty back again, and uh, there'll be quite a few other um, laws coming through judiciary, or bills coming through judiciary, which I will work on. And certainly if there's anything that the board needs to put in, oftentimes it's easier to get a late bill in through the Senate than it is through the House. So i um, happy to do that. You have to hold it down a little bit. Huh? Suzanne Harvey, state rep from War II. Um, on, I'm on the Science, Technology, and Energy Committee, which is particularly wonky about um, the electric grid, sources of electricity, um, all the utilities, the Public Utility Commission, um, energy efficiency, uh, renewable resources for energy. Um, these are the kinds of bills that that we deal with, and I've been on that for several terms. Um, energy efficiency is high on the list of priorities for me and a lot of my colleagues because it's the cheapest form of energy. It's the uh, energy that you d actually don't use. So um, the goal of most people interested in this is to have uh, an electric grid that's reliable 
and hopefully is based on clean energy sources. So the other thing I want to mention is um, I've been involved for many years on the, uh, the issue of human trafficking. And I'm on the state war, statewide, it's a collaborative task force on human trafficking. And um, we're having, it's not the task force that's doing it, but actually Harbor Homes and the school system putting on, um, on December 6th at Harbor Homes on High Street at 530, um, a forum on youth homelessness. And my particular interest is that um, homeless youths are so much at risk for human trafficking. Uh, they're the first easy praise for a trafficker. So I, uh, I urge you to show up if you're free that night and learn what you can, because it's a very important subject. We do have homeless kids, several hundred in Nashua, and uh, we want to keep them safe. Thanks. Sue, <clears throat> excuse me, Sue Newman, and I'm in my first term as a uh, state rep from Ward 2. I was on Public Works, I am on Public Works and Highways with Marty Jack, and I would echo his comments that there was a lot of infrastructure, roads, bridges, and quite a bit of um, presentations about the bus systems that are in the state. Um, I particularly was interested in rail. Um, it, any comment about rail did not get very far in our committee this session. Um, <coughs> things might change, I don't know. Um, as an old school board member, um, I remain exceptionally interested in public schools and how they are funded, um, ideally to be adequately funded, that's all. Hi, I'm Patricia Klee, um, Ward 3 State Rep and Ward 3 Ward Elect, ward elect <laughs> Alderman Elect, sorry. Um, I'm on the State, Federal, and Veterans Committee, and we deal with almost nothing with veterans. We deal mostly with constitutional law, I guess, changing our constitution, trying to secede from the state, I mean from the, the United States. <laughs> Um, just different things like that. Um, I was a little disappointed that we don't deal with as many veterans issues as we thought. And Loth is on that committee, so she understands what I'm talking about. It can be very frustrating. We should be doing more for our veterans, and we're not. But uh, that was my hope. After working 26 years with the, the Veterans Administration, I had hoped that some of my experience would help there, and it, it really didn't. Um, we are hoping to create a Veterans Administration within the VA, but even that, I don't think it's going to be what they were hoping it would be. Um, as a um, alderman elect uh, for Ward 3 and for Nashua, um, I guess the things I'm interested in are the infrastructure, trying to do affordable housing, um, what we can do, much of what you were talking about. Um, the affordable schools and school funding is also something extraordinarily important to me. Um, I want to see more public school dollars. And that doesn't necessarily mean that's something I can do as an alderman, but hoping that, um, as this is my first year, hoping to have a second year and maybe we can work on some kind of more alternate funding for the, less for the private schools and more for the public schools. Um, I've been working with NAMI now since uh, um, late spring and um, trying to come up with ideas, plans, funding, grants, et cetera. Um, to reduce the amount of warehousing of mental health patients in our ERs. And the last time I got a figure, I think it was 57 throughout the, the state. And that's 57 <coughs> patients that are living in our ERs throughout the state. Um, Concord has the most of them, and they create these things called um, yellow pods, where they keep the patients in. It's literally a small ER room for mental health patients and they can live up to a year, two. The average length of stay, I think, was 37 days, um, which is a long time. And that's because there's no space at the state hospital. Um, there's only one bill that my name is on, and I'm a co-sponsor of that, and that's HB 1236. And that is um, 
again, dealing with mental health. Right now, the way the statute's written is the superior court or circuit court can just say with a stroke of a pen, um, mental health court is done. Without taking into consideration anything with the presiding judge or anything like that. So what we're trying to do is put a committee together that would say that the presiding judge, the mental health court manager, law enforcement, the prosecution and the defense representative would all have a, we'd have a committee and they would have to say that it wasn't necessary. So um, <coughs> other than that, not much. <laughs> uh, my name's Dave Tenza, uh, Alderman at large. Uh, um, my, my concerns, areas of focus, I guess, would be uh, making sure that the uh, city implementing all the best practices as they relate to uh, the response to the heroin, cri heroin crisis, uh, that we are working together, uh, making sure that people are able to get the services uh, that they need uh, locally here uh, and family. Uh, I would also be interested in working with uh, Alderman Melissa Golja uh, talked about um, on housing issues, uh, in particular as it relates to working families, families who are uh, trying Good evening, uh, Alderman at Lodge, Michael O'Brien. Uh, we're for the city. I'm on the Budget, Finance, and Substandard uh, Housing Commission, and also just uh, recently appointed to the uh, newly formed uh, Rail Committee. I'm very excited about that. As far as the state, <clears throat> I've been up at the House for about 10 years. Uh, I've been on the same committee, the Transportation Committee, and served twice as its vice chair. I didn't write any bills this year. The other 399 of you are doing okay with it. So, <laughs> But what I choose to do as far as my committee, I watch what comes through and pick and choose which ones have the merit that need to come through. One of the ones was no texting while driving. That took two terms to work on it, and I think it's one of the best laws we ever passed in the state. I can't tell you how many kids or people we have saved in that endeavor. The other thing <clears throat> is on the transportation. We come to talk a lot about the commuter rail service. And unfortunately this year we received a bill that came through was to eliminate the rail authority in its entirety. Well, <clears throat> I think, uh, Mr. President, the other great save from the delegation was to keep that rail authority for the state in place. It's got to go before the House and everything else. It's too bad that it came up in the form to get rid of it. And I think that's got to go hand in hand with the new city objective, with the, uh, what we're entering into with the new group with the Providence Surface Rail Commission there. And uh, we're going to need the DOT and everything else. So I know I'm very proud of our delegation in Nashua. We seem to be, no pun intended, but all on board in commuter rail in, in the State House and uh, working with it. Because I do believe that's got to be the key economic, one of the key economic things that if we can punch a hole through 128 and get commuter rail from Boston, get it up here to Nashville, it goes both ways, we're going to open up the door to a economic vibrancy in the city that we have never seen since probably the 1800s. So I, I think this is something that uh, really needs to be done in the future. And uh, that'd be it. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Ernie Jetty. I'm the newly elected uh, Alderman elect from Ward 5. Um, and uh, I'm new to the board, so I've got a lot to learn. I know that. Uh, but while I, I'm here, with, uh, uh, I'm a little disappointed that there aren't more representatives here this evening. I see Alderman LeBrun is here, who's also a state rep from our ward. And I appreciate his being here. I wish there were more uh, reps here. Because when I was uh, uh, running for office, uh, one of the, th couple of the themes that people kept talking to me about was number one, the, uh, the schools, what they feel is a lack of support for our schools in, in the city, and, and also taxes. And the, the two kind of work hand in hand. Um, uh, people uh, legitimately don't want their taxes to go up, but, but people tell me that the reason that the city is under such pressure for taxes is because the state legislature uh, keeps pushing uh, fiscal 
financial responsibility down to the, the local cities and towns. Um, and I would like our, I hope that our representatives are in, in, the, in the, the state legislature would be watchdogs for us and would, uh, would resist uh, this, uh, this trend that has been going on for a number of years uh, of pushing responsibility for education, uh, responsibility for uh, you know, roads, uh, infrastructure, uh, down to the cities, putting on to the cities and the retirement uh, uh, fund, um, pushing more and more uh, fiscal responsibility to the city, uh, which is putting the city in, in, a, in a very difficult position to avoid uh, raising the taxes. And, and people see their taxes going up and they blame it on the city. <coughs> Uh, but I, I think part of the, a big part of the problem is the federal government is giving us less money and the state is giving us less money. So you, you representatives, I hope that you will protect us as much as you can. I know you're only a small number of the 400 up there, but uh, I hope that you watch out for that uh, for us. Thank you. I'm Trisha Piazzo. I'm the city clerk. Steve Bolton, I'm the City Corporation Council, and among other things, I and the other two lawyers in the office provide uh, support, guidance, and counsel to the Board of Aldermen, uh, largely in the form of preparing legislation and uh, giving advice and opinions on uh, law at all levels. Brought up for anybody that wants to speak. Representative Mandrapudi, did you want to say something? Copy. Um, this question is to the legal counsel. Um, I, in terms of uh, MOU that was signed for the Sister City Initiative, uh, it was like a very broad thing. So, is there a specific way at the government? level or city to city any exchange of funds or programs establishing. I seem to be going in circles in terms of finding a landing spot. So is, if you could shed a little bit of light, would help. Are you talking about this initiative for the rail? No, the sister city, sister city initiative between Mysore and Nashua. Oh, oh, oh. And if there is, I think there is, I didn't bring the copy, but it, there was, you know, uh, technology, ideas, programs, exchange of those very broadly specified that. And I think with the cultural exchange and art exchange kind of thing, there is, there is an opportunity to do it. So if it's financially, it's cities are coming into play. I, I am unaware of what might be going on in that regard. This question might better be addressed, uh, and unfortunately they're not here tonight, but the mayor or the economic development director, Tim Cummings. Uh, but I don't know of any, well, I have not been contacted concerning any further legal issues surrounding the program. Not, not legal issues. How does the addendum to the MOU, would that be, a full board vote, or is it just adding to the addendum to the MOU? Would well, it would certainly be possible if uh, there was a desire to enter into further programs, exchanges, or something to uh, modify the MOU by adding uh, addenda to it, or alter provisions that presently exist. I've not been contacted in that regard at all, however. Can I further ask a question? Uh, actually, the, I mean, the issue that you're bringing up has, is not about the interaction the with the legislature particularly. Okay. So I, I, would, I would advise you to take it up with the mayor. Okay. Representative slash Alderman LeBron. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I want to go back to uh, HB 124 the aircraft bill and explain it for those who are not familiar with it. The reason I filed the bill is because 
New Hampshire finds itself in a unique position. All the surrounding states have either eliminated or drastically reduced their registration fees. In New Hampshire, a corporate aircraft can cost $300,000 to register. In Massachusetts, you can do it for $300. Massachusetts has also done away with their sales tax on aircraft and aircraft parts. So th that was the reason I, I originally filed the bill. And what we did was, uh, as we went along, we modified it and changed some of the registrations on uh, uh, private aircraft as well. There's a 10-year plan similar to the uh, automobile registration that it decreases over a period until you get to 10 years and you pay nothing. But the, corpora the corporations, in fact, in Portsmouth, Green Mountain Coffee was at the negotiating table when they got a phone call and said, knock off negotiations with New Hampshire, we're going to Massachusetts. The green building down on, I think it's is it 28 or 128, is what Green Mountain Coffee built. There's probably 10,000 jobs down there that they took down there with them. So that's, that was the reason for filing the bill. We have to come in line with the, what the states around us are doing. We're surrounded by states that have either eliminated or drastically reduced the registration fees. So yeah, just, that's it. Just to follow up on that, there was a lot of discussion when that bill took place of what are we going to do with the revenue we lose because we won't be getting the $300,000, to which the response was, we're not getting it now. I mean, people, I, I talked with people who deal in airplanes and they would say, their customers would come and say, I want you to get me one of these and I want it to be 10 years and one day old when I take possession of it so that I get out of the registration fee. And we, we currently actually have a fairly large number of very expensive jets operating out of Nashua to, uh, to our great economic benefit. And they're actually, I mean, they're, they're the, the jets now, it used to be we had a lot of worries about noise, but the, the, with the stage three noise regulations, the jets that are here are very quiet. And like I say, there, are, there were 1.21 of them on the airport, which you hardly ever see them out, you know, they're, they're either in the hangar or they're flying. So, um, but but that that has brought a number of companies to Nashua that are that are beneficial. There's a company that's developing um, new infrared cameras so that planes can basically land in zero visibility fog, and uh, you know we're getting we're getting some really good economic benefits out of those planes being here. I just just to add on to that. Um, that bill, I think, is so important, and I think most of us just think of the airport as there, and it's the airport, and none of us, I think, fully appreciate, or few of us fully appreciate the economic impact the airport has um, in terms of companies who are here, as well as just the jobs that are there um, and the services that are being provided to the planes that are flying in and out. So. Um, in increasing traffic at the airport um, is certainly something that's important for our community. Alderman Lebrun. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, <clears throat> just to add to what's been said about this bill, uh, we have found a way to make it revenue neutral. Uh, I believe it was one, $1.2 million we were going to lose if uh, the bill went through in its original form and we found a way by amending the bill and re-amending it as the process went along to make it revenue neutral. So the state is not going to lose anything. Alderman Lopez? Yeah, um, not to completely pivot, but um, some other comments were made following mine regarding um, the vulnerability of children to human trafficking when they're homeless, um, the need to have uh, affordable housing, um, and I was just reminded of uh, an effort that um, Alderman and Representative O'Brien um, was working on towards the beginning of last year, where um, it came to light through discussion of the Substandard Living Conditions uh, Committee that it's a fairly regular practice for a landlord who's filing an eviction of a tenant to file it in a city other than where they are necessarily able to appear in court to defend themselves. And I think this is a protection against inappropriate eviction 
Um, if anything, it doesn't seem very just to me that somebody who is in the process of being evicted and may not have transportation to a different city has to go there to just defend themselves. So I know this was an effort that did not succeed in the State House, um, and I would love for it to be re-evaluated or looked at and followed up on. I think if somebody is going to face eviction or um, be told to leave their home, then the least we can do is make sure they can get to the court. I have a bill in on that this year, uh, Alderman Lopez. So I'll pass that on to you and let you take a look at it. Very efficiently done then. Yeah, to Alderman Lopez, I <clears throat> unfortunately you ran into a, a wall that where some people up there come from many walks of life and some people who sit particularly in the Senate were former landlords themselves and uh, did I think it really got a fair shake? Mm. I don't know. I have my opinion on that particular matter. Uh, but anyways, I think the climate up there right now is not conducive to a bill like that. And I'm hoping maybe we'll see uh, maybe in the next biennium things might be a little bit more where a bill such as that. Because uh, you're correct in bringing it up just because the bill failed, but the need did not go away. And that could happen very well in, you know, today as well. So it still needs to be addressed, and I agree with you. And I'd be happy to sponsor that, or if uh, <clears throat> Representative LeBrun has one of equal and tenure, I would uh, support that equally as well, too. Well, no doubt. You know, one of the things that, that's concerned me over the last couple of years, because I've had a family experience with it, is, is health care in the state of New Hampshire. Two areas that I think the state is trying to assist with but failing miserably is health care for the elderly and the veterans. Um, veterans, just to start with them, um, to get any kind of uh, hospital service has to go out of state to get it. You have a clinic where they used to have a hospital. I know there's a lot of work being done on that to, to help that, so that, that's good. I don't know how many of the reps have been to the nursing homes in the state of New Hampshire. I'll have to say they do a great job, but they have very limited resources, limited staffing, very limited funding, and, and uh, through no fault of their own, I don't think the elderly are getting the services that they actually deserve. And I think that needs to be looked into. The, the other thing is, um, I heard a lot about Medicaid and Medicaid funding and not having enough of it. If you ever had to apply for Medicaid here in the state of New Hampshire, you'd find out it's a daunting task, extremely difficult for the people that actually need it, the elderly, trying to figure out all the paperwork and the process. I will say the Department of Health and Human Services has great people. They go out of their way to help you, but they're understaffed, probably underfunded, and um, I think they need some help. Uh, I've talked to former Senator Ayotte about this, and it's, um, it's very disheartening. The process that it takes. Sorry, Rick. <laughs> nice. You pick a different music selection. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's very disheartening um, to see how many people are missing out on, on the help that they could get through Medicaid funding and through the Department of Health and Human Services because they don't know where to start, they don't know how to figure out the paperwork, and the paperwork is huge. I mean, you could, you could probably buy a major building somewhere in the state easier than you can apply for Medicaid here in New Hampshire. Something's got to be done. And I hope that I'll be putting my two cents in soon. But I think, uh, you know, in, in nursing homes, mental health, correction system, everywhere, the underlying issue we cannot ignore is the workforce, need for workforce. And uh, county uh, nursing homes, that was the big thing in the Hillsborough County because they didn't have people. They were trying to advertise and to get, you know, and again, it's a vicious cycle in terms of 
people with uh, addiction and you know they're not able to get people so I think we still as a state we are acutely in need of good youth and workforce and whatever we can do however we and especially city being the mo second largest city and the largest uh, county part of the largest county it is one of the issues and whatever we can do to kind of work together to have bills that would support and help in terms of workforce sustaining bringing new people in and um, that would have a big impact I can tell you as a first generation immigrant you know it, I can see the community contributing but it's not enough and the uh, incoming students, incoming international uh, students, visitors, that has impacted tremendous, <coughs> tremendously. And that's something, I don't know how we address it. And it's going to affect small states like this, which short-term solution to workforce is inward migration. I, I think you were talking more about just Healthcare costs and and, <clears throat> and well, nursing homes. One of them is one part of it is healthcare costs. In in that, um, um, it, it, when you balance the cost of a nursing home for somebody to be in there, versus what they get for aid and what is spent for staffing, yep. there's some inequities. Um, of course, with a nursing home, there's a lot of liabilities, and I'm sure a lot of that takes yeah. into account. But, um, you know, they may have one nurse that's overseeing 20 or 25 patients, um, and these are people that need a lot of help, and they're not getting it. They're not getting the help that they should get. They, I can't blame the people that are working there. They do an outstanding job, and they do what they can. But, um, you know, Having been closely related uh, with the uh, with nursing homes, and like I said, the last two years, I can tell you that they're crying for help. And uh, I think you know the state legislature has to do something to help them. Representative Clinton. Hi, I'm on two of the issues. One on the veterans. I know what you're saying about being a clinic. They have, um, and this is on the federal level. That Man the Manchester VA, they've kind of dispersed it to various other hospitals where they have gotten, they can do care there now. So it's the VA doctors are able to care for the doctors and other facilities, I mean for the patients and other facilities. That's something that the state can't do. The veterans bill that they're trying to put through um, to create a veterans administration is not going to create a hospital, but what it would do is kind of be a focal point to help veterans get care, um, whether it's to help them get benefits, to help them so on. The way the VA works is, yeah, I, I worked for them for 26 years, I agree with you. The majority of our veterans either go to the Boston area, because Bedford, even though it's probably the closer hospital, is not really a medical facility as much as it's a geriatric care facility. Um, the Up in the north, they'll go to White River Junction. But that's only really the Hanover area that, that takes care of our patients there. But a patient can go anywhere. Hopefully, they will make a decision as to what they're going to do with the Manchester VA. My angst is that they're going to try to close it. They're going to say that it's useless, just give them vouchers and send them on. The veterans community, um, I've been working with two veterans groups, they have mixed emotions about it. Um, and again, this goes beyond the state, it's still the federal level on, on that particular thing. I'm not sure that the state can really get involved other than for us to have resources. Like Massachusetts has a veterans hospital, a state veterans hospital. We don't have that here. We would have to actually create something like that. Um, like I said, the veterans groups that I've been working with have mixed emotions of whether or not they want to be w in a VA where they're, um, they're with their own kind, so to speak, with their uniqueness um, versus going into the, the public arena. And they are split on that. As, as far as the nursing home, our, the Hillsbury, Hillsborough County nursing home, I've worked with them, and one of the concerns were that things weren't getting processed. They'd get kicked back. They, they'd have to reapply every time a patient came in or when the one year was up, trying to get the funding from the state. That's something the state can do. We can try moving that. As far as them not having the resources, um, when I spoke to them, 
the bodies aren't there to hire. They put out applications, they have job fairs, they're just not getting it. Again, that's something the state can do. I know we did have legislation at one point to try to help with um, the cost of the education, and most of them failed. So in that case, yes, I think the state can get involved in, in that. As far as the VA is concerned, it's very federal, and unless we create our own state hospital, which many states have, um, they're gonna continue to go out of state unless the, vote, vouch, the federal voucher program comes through. And I'm not sure that's a really good thing either. Because what happens is the federal government notoriously doesn't pay on time. And they're not reimbursing these people. And what's happened so far with what they call VA Choice is I spoke to one person who had um, a knee surgery uh, to have it replaced. And the doctor it took a year and a half to get paid for that knee surgery, refused to do the other one because he was not a VA doctor. Um, one of our um, um, committee members, uh, she was approached by a gentleman who had coronary issues, and um, the cardiac specialist in New Hampshire said to him, well, you know, you're not critical right at the moment, go to Boston, and basically sent them on to Boston and refused to do them because these people are taking anywhere from six months to a year and a half to get paid, and it comes down to the bottom line. So. That really is an issue with the federal government. They're failing us. Yeah, I know that the VA is a, is a federal issue, and yeah. so I know you. But the very state little of anything you can do at the state level. Yeah. Uh, and um, my only concern as a as a veteran there is that yeah. if, if if you go out and put yourself in harm's way so that people can actually have the freedoms they enjoy, yeah. then if they come back and they're wounded and stuff and yeah. they need help, that they should get the best help they can get, and all too often they don't get it. They should be able to go anywhere, yeah. Dartmouth Hitchcock, and get and get their services paid for by the government. Yeah, and and that's actually kind of what the voucher program does. But there's limitations to the voucher program the way they put it through. What they do is um, it took a while to get it through. The choice was each doctor had to apply like CMC couldn't apply or Concord Hospital couldn't apply so that they could give services. Each doctor providing service had to apply. They did kind of streamline that on the federal level to, to make that a little bit better. Um, I know exactly what you're talking about. I have a, a husband who was drafted in 69 during Vietnam, so he goes through the same thing. Also works for the VA. Um, so yeah, and, and I, I hate to see the dismantling, and I agree with you they should be able to go anywhere they want. And that's where the veterans groups kind of have a different, the healthier veterans want to be able to go anywhere they can. Uh, many of the veterans with PTSD and mental health issues want to stick together. They want the VA to stay. So there's, you can see both sides of it. Um, so I would like to see, I mean, New Hampshire was given, granted um, 30 miles versus the actual 50 miles. So that meant they could go to CMC or they could go to Concord Hospital, or they could go to Elliott. But these hospitals don't want them because they're not paying the bills. The uh, with the nursing home, my experience has been with the private nursing homes, not the, the state, state yeah. funded, which I can imagine is even worse. Yeah. One of the problems they have hiring people is that, well, first of all, you have to be a special person to want to work with the elderly, uh, because it, it's uh, a tough thing to to do, and but they're not getting paid what they would get if they were working at the Elliott. Yeah. Not even close. Yeah. And that's why they're having a problem hiring people, because we're not paying them. I mean, but, at least we ought to try to close that gap so they can have some chance of getting additional staff. That's kind of the same problem that we're having with our mental health doctors mm -hmm. on the state level. We haven't given them a raise in almost a decade, I think it is. I think it's 11 years. Mm. They haven't raised that. And that's why we can't get mental health physicians here. And that is a state issue. Yeah, I, I just want to <clears throat> respond to some of the things I just heard about the VA. I go to the VA. I go to specialists that the VA sends me to. The only thing I need is prior authorization. authorization. Mm -hmm. It's not that they don't want to send us, and it's not because they're not getting paid. They, they send me to specialists regularly. I have an appointment coming up with a specialist uh, outside the VA. 
There's nothing wrong with Manchester VA. Nothing at all. They have made great strides in trying to accommodate veterans with the specialized cases that they, they have. Uh, you know, I, I can't say anything bad about the VA. The other thing is on the nursing homes. Hillsborough County has the only nursing home in the entire state that's in the black. No other hospital, a nursing home is in the black except Hillsborough County. So, and, and, and the other thing that uh, you mentioned was uh, White River Junction. White River Junction has closed. There is no R White River Junction anymore. When did that happen? I that apologize about, for not understanding. About a month ago. Okay. Um, you misunderstood me. When I said about the um, not getting paid, I didn't mean the VA wasn't getting paid. I meant that the specials aren't getting paid timely. Um, and you're, it may be your doctors are putting in the paperwork exactly the way that they want it. The, the cases that I did, in fact, speak to, the one from Linda Masmilla, the cardiac specialist there, it was a year and a half. The gentleman that, that I spoke to from Manchester with the knee surgery where he wouldn't go for the second one, that was 19 months that he did not get paid. These are the cases that this. I agree with you. I worked for the VA for 26 years. I don't want to see it dismantled. I think it's the most incredible program considering the number of hospitals they have throughout the, throughout the entire country, including Guam and Puerto Rico. I think it's the most fantastic system they put through the first <coughs> electronic record, I would say nothing bad about them. So if you thought that I did, then that's my apology. As far as the nursing home, you're right. I should have said the Hillsborough is the only one in the black. When I spoke to them in the accounting and I walked, worked with DHHS, they're still not getting paid timely. They are in the black and they do a phenomenal job, but they were not getting paid timely. They had some cases that were open for over a year and that weren't being paid. So you're right on the things that you said. You just misunderstood what I meant. It's just we're still not getting paid. And as far as the not getting um, the, the amount of money to mental health doctors and so on, we are paying less than others. So there's no reason for them to come into the state of New Hampshire when they can go to Massachusetts or Vermont or something like that. And that much you must know. You must agree with me on that. Yeah. So, but yeah, no, I, I think the VA is second to none. I really do. I know we. We only hear bad things about it, but I can tell you after working with them for as many years as I did, I started from the bottom, worked all the way up. I was part of the Veterans Integrated Service Network, which was all of the New England VAs. I went from Togus all the way down to West Haven to Providence. I, I dealt with every single one of the hospitals, and I have nothing but wonderful things to say about them. Representative Harvey. Okay, I just want to um, chime in about the Hillsborough County Nursing Home, which I have great respect for. It's been run by a great director who recently left, but um, it is running in the black, and that's great. But among the Hillsborough County delegation, there's great reluctance, understandably, to raise county taxes. So when we don't raise county taxes or raise them infinitesimally, um, the services may not get what they need. So the biggest problem that I see at both the Correction Center in Valley Street and uh, the nursing home that we hear over and over and over again is uh, when they put out word for jobs, open, opening for jobs, people don't want them because they can get money elsewhere, better money elsewhere. It happens over, they might come there and get trained as newbies and then they go on, they leave. Um, so I think, again, it comes back to New Hampshire, and we hear this all the time in the legislature, New Hampshire is a very wealthy state and a very cheap state. Alderman Lopez, did you ever end up? I was actually going to make a comment similar to what was being expressed. Um, in attracting workers to the health field, I think part of what we could do is look at the licensure and make sure that it's not unachievably counterintuitive. If people are working on the, a licensure requirement that they could go over the border and complete the same licensure for 200 less hours where they're not getting paid and 
they're just spending money on internship costs and that kind of thing, then they're, they're going to do that. So I think looking at the different licensing uh, requirements and making sure that we stay absolutely competitive in terms of the quality, but not counterproductive in terms of uh, the rigidity, and make sure that we, if we don't have enough uh, nurses, LNAs, or um, people working with the elderly, then those are areas where those licensures need to be examined to make sure they're not getting in the way of people who are special and want to make a difference and are, are passionate about doing that type of work, but aren't necessarily special enough to follow every, jump through every hoop that is put in front of them. Senator Gawaski. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I th we're, we're being televised, I think. So. Okay. Um, uh, Alderman Lopez, that has just been passed uh, in the past, led in this last session, that if uh, you are um, licensed in another state, particularly Massachusetts, then there will be reciprocity without going through the added hoops that had been necessary. So, um, you know, hopefully that will help alleviate some of the uh, lack of, of help that we've had here. That's a very good step, and I'm glad to hear it. But now my next question is, what I was specifically speaking of was the New Hampshire licensure requirement. So now I'm kind of wondering if people are going to try to get their licensure in Massachusetts, thinking they can transfer it to New Hampshire, and then not necessarily choosing to because you can get paid more competitively in Massachusetts. So I just, I still think looking at the state, our state's licensing requirements in areas where there's definite need and making sure that we haven't created a barrier by asking too much of people trying to enter a new field um, is something we should do. And then also making sure that we're retaining professionals by um, making sure that the licensure we have is necessary and um, at least consistent with the states around us? Well, um, partly we're going to retain them by uh, giving them a living wage, which uh, we don't do that very well. Representative Manjapudi. Um In continuing with the licensing, and uh, you know, I just wanted to ask if the clarification in terms of is the state still underserved because especially in mental health and uh, healthcare fields, the doctors uh, and mental health workers, uh, psychiatrists, there was an acute shortage of psychiatrists in the state as uh, in general and particularly Nashua area was, uh, there was a shortage and FQAs like Harbor Homes and stuff had a special way of getting people from outside, not necessarily outside the country but outside the state because there was no reciprocity, federal reciprocity, or uh, so that was one of the things that Southern New Hampshire Medical Center was looking at to see if we can have legislation to strengthen that the federal reciprocity for doctors and mental health workers. And I have to look at that bill that uh, passed with the reciprocity for nurses and stuff and see if that holds good for doctors too because the licensing for doctors is a very elaborate process and other states are doing as a federal registry, federal licensing and that goes across. So, Yes, um, I'd just like to follow up on that. Um, Senator Lasky, so the reciprocity you were talking about was across medical licensing, um, nurses, uh, I was psychologists and, and sociology, and I'm not sure whether it was through the, it wasn't uh, MDs. Okay, and not allied health Because I believe there already is reciprocity with that, okay. and that would be up to the Board of Medicine. Okay, thank you. Alderman O'Brien. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, if I may change gears, <clears throat> bring up another different subject matter. But currently, to let you know, and you should, but there's a de decentennial committee that's meeting with the, uh, the pension system right now. 
that's occurring up there at the State House. Why is that important? Let's look what happened in the municipal budget this year. They wanted to make well the fast track, or whatever you want to call it, in the pension system to the tune to the city of Nashville of $2 million. If the budget was going up, let's say, $3 million, but we had to take $2 million to pay the state to cover the cost for our obligations with the uh, pension system, and the state's got to get their money from the city, <clears throat> that would have brought us into a, a problem. We have a pending court case that we're waiting to hear on and a way that we try to solve the solution here in the city. But the problem is the $2 million obligation still hasn't gone away and it's going to be there next year and the next couple of years. And the problem with that is whose fault is it? Well, we fought two wars and anybody that has a 401k or anything and looking at their own personal uh, involvement in the stock market, you can see now the thing seems to be doing well. But you can see what happened. We went through a period of time. And the pension system relies very heavily on the, on the stock market, just as much as your 401k does. So it is a mirror and does reflect in everything else of what occurs with it. So other changes have been made in positive. But I would like to bring that up as we're going to see what's going to come out of this committee. What is it going to bring back to us in the city from us, our delegation and everything, and to our obligations to further into the pension system. Now, I'm, I clear to understand we're somewhere around the 67, if my number is correct, I may not, but it's in the 60s or something like that. Uh, <clears throat> I also sit on the uh, pension board for the DPW, and we're at 83%. We seem to be running that, our city pension system with the, the BPW very well. I don't know what's happening <laughs> with the 400 people up at the state. But anyways, I think uh, some changes. We're going to have to watch this particular commission, see what it comes down to. And I would like to remind the delegation, 35% of the e economic economy that goes to the state of New Hampshire, 35% comes from the metro Manchester, Nashua region. Yet, when we come up and breathe things such as commuter rail or other type of things, they don't give us the time of day. Yet the good people of some place like Bartlett or some other hinterlands where they live, they rely on us for their education. Every lottery ticket that gets sold in the city of Nashua, and how many lot lottery tickets do you think get sold? How many keno will be played in the future in this city that will go back to some other city and town? So I would like to encourage the delegation to bond together, talk to our friends from other parts. I know Alderman McCarthy and I have uh, good communication with people that we sit in the house and sit on the uh, automatic board. Uh, we worked with the uh, safe station initiatives, uh, one of the things we have done. Uh, but talk to your peers up there. Try to sell the national idea, which is, I think, very important. Try to get them to realize that. They don't just roll their eyes and say, oh, there's Nashua again. You know, the Nashua has particular needs. <clears throat> We're the ones with workforce housing. I don't see workforce for housing in some other parts of the state, yet it's here. I see we have, and very fortunate, to have two veterans' homes for people who have some difficulties. I don't see them in other communities uh, within the 20 mile radius on some. So Nashua has broad shoulders, and we have done well, and we've done our well to be the part of the state. And I think that if we band together and talk to our friends up there and try to get the initiative to come back and try to help us out, particularly when it's going to affect our taxpayers, such as that fast tracking, which didn't need to be done so acutely. But uh, the $2 million annually is a big chunk of, you know, to our taxpayers right here in the city. I think it's important to note that $2 million is the uplift in this year alone. If you look at the scope of the problem, we believe our actual steady state contribution to the pension system to keep it running is $8 million a year. The check we're writing this year is for $23 million. There's an additional $15 million in the get well costs for the pension plan that is, and that, that uplift of 15 million has come over the last six or seven years and has been a tremendous 
uh, burden in a capped budget to be able to do anything else uh, that the city needs. Okay. Alderman Mosey going? Just to um, Alderman O'Brien or Representative O'Brien's um, comment about working together with um, your fellow representatives. If you look at what's happening in southern New Hampshire, we are starting to come together more and more as a larger regional group. Um, you look at our bus system and you know what we're doing with Milford and an interest in working outside of the city limits. So not only are we generating the additional dollars from Nashua, because of what's happening in this region, we're generating even more dollars. And it's important to, I think, work with people within the region, from Milford, from Hollis, from Brookline, from Hudson, from Litchfield, and say, look at, we as a region are starting to share some benefits and some concerns. And we need to band together to make sure those dollars are flowing here. I mean, I have people in Hudson say to me all the time, what's gonna happen when that development goes in on Bridge Street? And I'm like, well, there's a plan for a rotary. So it's, it's really, really important, I think, that we start looking outside of the city of Nashua and start thinking more regionally because we are working more regionally and things are happening across our region. So I think that's another piece that we need to look at as we look at what dollars are being generated, not only in Nashua, but in southern New Hampshire, just within our region that's covered by the Regional Planning Commission. What's being generated here and how much of it is coming back to address keeping our economic engine going? I think there's also, when you look at Nashua as the anchor for the region, there are a lot of services that are provided by Nashua. We're the Absolutely. major source of social services and of you know, safety nets, et cetera. And unfortunately, the cost of that is borne solely by the Nashua taxpayers, even though we're providing a regional service. At yes. some point, I think there has to be some way to deal with that. And in fact, revenue from the state would normally be the way that would be handled. But. Alderman Jenny. Alderman elect. Alderman elect Jenny. <laughs> I'm not there yet. <laughs> um, on a slightly different tack, but kind of along the same lines, uh, what is the feeling among the delegation about this um, bill that uh, is coming up about the scholarship program where people can uh, apply to this uh, nonprofit scholarship program? and uh, get money, that, that scholarship program can take money from the city uh, that, is, that the state provides for, you know, f to the city f to, uh, to educate students, take, take that money and give it to a private individual to homeschool their child or send their child to a private school. What, wh where does that stand and, and how is that gonna affect us, uh, we taxpayers in Nashua? Senator Lasky. <laughs> um, uh, Alderman-elect, did you mean uh, by having public uh, funds going to private and uh, religious schooling, the bill that was just passed out of committee? Is that, is that what you're referring to? Yes. I, for one, am <laughs> wholly against it. Um, I think if this continues, it could be the death knell for public education. Um, I think we support alternative schooling. Um, I think there is, you know, an obligation for that, but for public funds to go to, uh, religious schools and, and private schools, I think is, is a violation of the separation of church and state. And it is, um, again, going to hurt our public schools where I believe the fund should go, yes, to address problems within the public schools and problems that they have, but they're never gonna get fixed if we continually take away from um, what, what they need to have. So I will, will fight that 
uh, that bill or if, if it should come forward? Just in that lines, in terms of uh, funding that goes away, the way I understand it is when every dollar that's taken out of public school, say if 100 students come out of public schools where 12,000 uh, students are serving, they come from uh, 16 different schools, parts of it. So the infrastructure, the maintenance, and the staffing cannot reduce, but the funding is being drained from the public schools. So we have to look at the bigger picture. It's like, it's not about, and you know, I for one is totally against it because it only takes a small portion. If I get, or my child gets $2,500 to go to a, pub, a private school, show me which good public, uh, private school takes $2,500 to educate my child. And it's, it's not quality education that we can, it's j just a, you know, it's a feel good, this is we are doing the right thing, we are giving the parent a choice, but we are not giving the parent a choice. And we are depleting the resources that's coming to the public schools. And the infrastructure, the uh, funding system for uh, staff, and all that cannot uh, be cut in public schools with 100 or 200 people going away from that. So and that aspect, I think we have to highlight uh, if the delegation is not on board, because as we said, we have to come together as a delegation of a city of this size. And as long as we can back that up, and it's, it's about what's good for Nashua. And then, you know, it's, it's not about party line. Hi. Um, the, the issue that I, I have with it is we have a constitution that basically says that we cannot use tax dollars <laughs> for um, religious schooling or anything of that nature. I think we kind of play a game because we have our um, education uh, fund that is comes from lottery and so on, other kind of money. So they can probably play the word game and say, they're not using tax dollars for it. But the bottom line is we're still funding religious schooling and so on. So I'm very much against it. I would be fighting as much as I possibly can, but it's come out of committee and we'll see where it goes from there. All the women, Melissa Goldberg. I, I would just like to make a comment. Um, about two months ago, you couldn't go anywhere and talk to anyone who had even a slight sense of what was going on in the state, um, who wasn't talking about Amazon and where they were going to be and N New Hampshire's chance of landing Amazon. And I listened on the radio one morning and to my surprise, heard the governor talk about, well, well, we'll start investigating rail <laughs> because Amazon wants rail. And I think there are many of us in the city and across the state who have understood that rail is important. It's an economic driver. Um, and we all hear about millennials not wanting cars, but I'll tell you what, when I go to a city where I have good public transportation, I don't rent a car. I use the cabs, I use the buses, and I use the subways. And I don't even need my smartphone. I can walk up and read it, figure out which stop I need, and, um, and it works. And when I, I'm in a country where English isn't the major language, I can read the map and figure out where to go. But we all knew rail was important, and all of a sudden, we're going to start looking at rail instead of being kind of shovel-ready and knowing what we were doing. And I, I bring that up because we moved here 20 years ago, and in some ways it seems like I've been here forever, and in other ways we're quite new here. But one of the things we did when we looked at where we were going to live in relationship to where my husband was going to be working at Lockheed Martin, 
because we were coming here with a five-year-old daughter, and we hoped to be here to get her through sixth grade. Now she's 26, graduate of Nashua High South. But when we came here, we didn't say, what are the parochial schools like? What are the private schools like? We said, what are your public schools like? And to this day, when I meet young families and talk to people as we're traveling, one of the questions that comes up is, what are the public schools like in Nashua? I, just walking my ward, I ran into a family with a little girl in a stroller. She was probably 18 months, two years old. And we had this conversation about the public schools. And they said, yeah, our neighbors up the street, they send all their kids to public schools. So we're feeling good about the public school here. So I think we need to think about everything we do with a bigger lens and realize that it's not just, I want my child to be homeschooled, or I want to go to parochial school, and I have to say, many of you know, and I remember the Board of Ed, it was the same month my daughter started at Nashua Catholic. I paid for it, it was my choice. She went there and then she went back to South. But we have to realize, public school's important. When people are moving into communities and buying homes, and if you've moved, you know all the expenses of setting up a new household, having a good quality public school is really, really important. And it's important for our neighborhoods because that's where our kids get together. And that's where we get together as families and form community. So I would just encourage you and encourage you to have conversations with your colleagues about the benefits of public education and the importance of public education from an economic development perspective. Because the checklist isn't how many good parochial schools are there within 50 miles? Where are my, my employees going to send their kids? Because they probably don't want to pay their employees to pay tuition either. Um, so I would just leave that with you. Think about it in a broader sense. Senator Lasky. Um, this country has been founded on our, one of the things I believe that has made this country great over the years is our public education system and is the fact that regardless of what religion you are, what you know, ethnic background, whatever, you are entitled to a public education. That is not the case. If you choose to send your child to a, a private school or a religious school, so be it. All you know, more power to you, each kid's I myself sent my girls to private school. There were extenuating circumstances, and each child has individual needs. We need to, I believe, instead of trying to take away from our public school system, I believe I said it before, is to make sure it is the best that it can be for every child in this state and this country. Uh, we are depleting it, again, by trying to uh, make it fairer for those who choose to send their children elsewhere, have the opportunity to send their, their children elsewhere. Um, but it's not, in my mind, it's not what um, education should be in this country. So, um, again, you know, I respect we have charter schools. I respect we are trying to do our best to make uh, advantages for each child in this state because they are all different. But I do not believe it should be at the expense of our public school system. Representative Schmidt. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I think it's pretty clear that uh, this bill is a priority for the governor. I think that that's a real danger up at the State House, and I think anything anyone can do from this table to talk to people and let them know about the problems with the bill. The bill is faulty. It's been stated that by the, um, by the chair of the committee as they passed it. They said the bill was faulty and they'd fix it later. 
Um, I think we have to make sure that we spread the word that this is not a good bill for the state, but more than that, this bill is just simply a bad bill and should never become law. Thank you. Anything else? Representative. This be the appropriate time, Mr. President, to make an announcement about the Hillsborough County uh, Executive Committee. About the what? The Hillsborough County Executive Committee. We have accepted two ratified contracts uh, from the uh, nursing home union and uh, another, I, I forget what union it's from, and we have accepted them and, de and uh, determined that we will pass them on to the Hillsborough County full delegation. So I'm looking at Janu January 10th at 6 o'clock in the evening as the, the next possible full delegation meeting to uh, ratify those contracts. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other topics we'd like to go on? It's 8.30ish. Um, are these meetings useful or should I have another one in three or four months when we get into the uh, session? Alderman Dowd? Yeah, I think they're useful, but I wish we could get more of the state delegation here. Um, I think I only see one Republican. I could be wrong. <laughs> Two. <laughs> three. Are you making the delegation? No, no. Representatives. Okay. Two Republicans and Well better yet. How many how many are here? I thought I saw a controversy unfolding. <laughs> how many are here versus the total number from Nashville? Total I venture to guess we don't even have half here. And it's not half. Is there a better half time half. of day maybe to meet for state reps? Nine, nine ten, or ten, ten of us. Has to pretty well be in the evening. <coughs> Saturday. Yeah. yeah. Representative McKay. Thank you. Um, couple things. One, I was remiss in stating that I represent Ward 3, so I wanted to clear that up. Um, I have a couple of questions, I think. What is Nashua, the city of Nashua, their biggest issues that they would like we as a state delegation to understand to um, how do we come together with the aldermen and the delegation when there's an issue? Um, there's legislation right now, I think it's S uh, HB 92, and um, that has to do with the building codes and updating them to the 2015. And I know Bill McKinney, Nashua's building inspector, is very concerned about that. And as we all should be, we need to update our codes. When is a good time to be able to have meetings so that we can bring together the aldermen and the state delegation to have a conversation so when we go up there, we can stand united and say, this is a city issue and we need to bring it forward as a city issue. I would like to be able to help in that cause. And so that's just for me. As for day and time, maybe the holiday had an effect on this particular meeting. Sometimes it's easier in the morning. I've seen more people get together in the morning around breakfast time. Uh, but again, um, I think <laughs> as the weather gets nicer, it's, it's easier later. But I still think that earlier is sometimes better. So I'll address a couple of things you said. I, as, with regards to things like the, the bill on building codes, um, we've had a lot of discussion about what the role of the Board of Aldermen should be in state legislation. And in fact, on most of the things that deal with departments, um, we actually kind of trust those opinions to our professionals. And I, I would encourage the delegation to meet with the building code officials. And in fact, we have the same issue with the city clerk's office often. We have the same issue with the assessor's office because there are lots of bills that come up every term that are highly technical and for the most part, um, we would rather have the staff 
give you expert opinions than us give us our uh, give you our opinions. Um, it's the policy bills that we're concerned with. Um, from that perspective, well, it's mostly about the money. I mean, if 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 I go back and look at where we are now versus where we were 20, 30 years ago, we got we we were originally promised. $20 million in a grant to build the CTE program at the high schools. We never saw a nickel of it. We were promised 30% reimbursement on the principal of the um, bonds to build the two high schools. We might have seen 15% some years. Often we saw nothing. Um, you know, the, there's just the, the downshifted costs and the things that where we made a decision based on what the funding was going to be, and it then dried up, have shifted a tremendous burden onto the onto the city. And uh, you know, the, the retirement system, as we talked about, there's there's probably thirty million dollars plus in today that wouldn't have been there had had things stayed the same as they were when we made those decisions. You know, we're 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 pretty good at working around that and, and not blowing the tax rate up while paying for that ever-growing burden. But those are the things, I think, that, that uh, affect us the most. Um, the other one, as was mentioned, is rail. You know, it would be great to get help from the state, but under the current circumstance of us having the memorandum of understanding with, with the Boston Surface Rail Transit, I guess as a secondary ask, what I'd ask is that the state not get in the way of a solution we found on our own. I, I, and I am very concerned that that could happen. I hope that that does not happen. I concur. We absolutely need to have rail. And you know, we've, we've found a solution that may not be optimal, but it, but, it, but it is better than every other one in that it may come to fruition. So, you know, and, and, and the guys that are looking at it are doing uh, Worcester to Providence now, they're looking at Bedford to Lowell for us, and then they're going to look at Lowell down to Worcester eventually, which will give us some very good access to, to places we don't currently have access to. So I'm, I'm happy about that. What I'm, my concern is, you know, that, that if the Rail Transit Authority as it is gets in the middle of that and makes decisions that it thinks are for the greater good, that that mess up that arrangement, uh, I'd be very disappointed with, with that having been the, the final outcome of, of the work we've done, so. I think I would be too. <laughs> um, Alderman Lizzie Yes, Gallier. I will just be brief. Um, Representative McKay, I, I totally appreciate um, the difficulty with evening meetings, but I will say to some of us have night jobs, or day jobs, and night meetings are what we do. And you're right, I get it. It's really difficult to, to try and get people to come together. Uh, we probably would have had a better representation. Again, I think a lot of tonight's issue is the holiday. Right. So I, I, I concur. Sometimes it's really easier to have people at night. It, it just, it's hard to, to choose. Senator Wolanski. Thank you. I have a question. Do we have an, um, a liaison anymore with the legislature from the city? I don't believe so. Correct? Um, I don't know what yeah. Ms. Kleiner can probably address who's there from the mayor's office. We have actually got um, our legislative assistant. One of her duties now is to um, take care of that for the board. Okay. So we, I, we actually send her up to testify at hearings. Uh, and, and it isn't, it's, it, to me, it's more of the communication between the city and the, legisla uh, the legislation at, that's coming forward. Uh, the other thing I know in the past, we used to have a meeting with the department heads and um, the mm. delegation where they would get into maybe, you know, specific bills. And I think that's always very helpful. I think where we have newer aldermen and, and uh, you know, we're, all, we're in the middle of a legislative session, so we don't have, you know, no one in the legislature is brand new. 
But at any rate, I believe there are a lot of people who have not been to various departments, not seen a lot of the agencies and a lot of the people that, that we work with. And that is really important because sure. you have to understand. The other thing, the last thing, I'm sorry, Brian, I want to say is that we are sent here, we are sent to Concord by the people mm -hmm. of Nashua and in some cases, you know, the center is, it, the other center is the surrounding area. Too often I have seen our representatives uh, put their leadership first, their party first, and many other things before the citizens of this city and the people who have sent them to represent them. And that to me <laughs> is the hardest thing. If we stuck together, when, you know, when it arises, yes, there will always be a few, but when we know that our city and the people in our city are going to benefit from certain things, and we say no because someone else is breathing down our necks for a parking place or a chairmanship or some other ridiculous thing, then none of us deserve to be representing the citizens of this city. Representative um, Just to acknowledge that this, uh, this session particularly um, as a uh, rep, I did get a lot of information or at least support from the city or city uh, hall and you know mayor's office or if you know several times I would be on the floor and this is going this way the bill is and this how it's going to affect Nashua dollars as well as in terms of policy it was very very helpful even though we don't have a particular liaison and to get that information and uh, uh, send it back to, you know, share it with the Nashua delegation there, at least the people that are sitting around. So they were very, very helpful. And I think these meetings, at the end of the day, we are still social beings. And as much as we can live off of Facebook and uh, social media, at the end of the day, uh, meeting in flesh and blood makes all the difference because you put the humanness into this. So, and I, I thank you for keeping this consistent, and it means a lot to me, and uh, to represent the voices of my constituents, and also as a city what, where my home is. So I thank you for that. Ms. Conner, you want to update us on who's? So um, we did have um, a liaison, Derek Danielson, um, from the city, and Derek has left the city unfortunately. So what we have been working with with our IT department is an automated process where the city can download all the bills where they are, send those out to our division directors to get inf information back from them, um, like Alderman McCarthy was saying, to get that expert um, advice on bills. Um, last year we sent emails yep. to the delegation. Um, we got a lot of feedback on that, that it was too tedious of a spreadsheet. I think at that time it had over a hundred bills on it that we were tracking through committee. Um, this year we expect it to be much more streamlined um, and we expect those emails to start going out shortly. Um, certainly, there's some bills at the city that we're discussing already. Um, we've had quite a bit of discussion on SB 193 um, in the mayor's office and uh, with the superintendent. Um, but those delegation emails will go out again shortly um, once we get the automated process back from our division directors. And as I said, I have. Uh, legislative manager. Um, we did just hire a new transcriptionist, by the way, so some of her time is freed up again. Um, but she is one of her responsibilities is to work on on the at least the policy bills for the for the board. So we'll do that. Um, 
I, I also want to point out there was discussion about the department heads. One of the things we do when there's big turnover in the Board of Aldermen is to um, have orientation the early part of the term and have the department heads come in and talk about them. So while, while I want to keep that focused on the Board of Aldermen getting it, I'd be happy to let the delegation one know and anybody's welcome to come and, and listen to what happens. Thank you. I also, uh, Alderman McCarthy, I also want to say I believe some of the um, representatives have participated in the Citizens Academy. I think I've, I've seen some of you there and, and I know people had yeah. very positive feedback about that also as a way to yes. really learn more about the city. It's a long program though. It is, <laughs> it is, but I, I know that some people commented they felt it was well worth it. Alderman O'Brien. Eight hundred. So, which ones are really the particular? And I appreciate that. And if you have something that's got a streamline, brilliant. Share it with the state. You know what I mean? But, uh, um, but the thing is, we should really just follow. It's got to be important to us. And I would like to follow up with that streamlining. If you can put an opinion, okay, people are going to vote by what they are entitled to. It would be nice if everybody voted for Nashua, but sometimes people do get leaned on and not put different things like that. So kind of like to have, you know, within the via email or something like that, the natural perspective to it, that that representative can weigh the balance and say, no, I'm a Nashua first, i got to go with it. That's the way it should really be. So I would like to see yeah. that, you know, as contact. Now, I kind of understand if anybody here... Yeah. on our emails and everything else. But I'm sure everybody that's in the state delegation sees what gets out there in the state emails. It's almost, I don't know if they ever heard the right to know. It's not a very last out there. But it's a form of communication that we can get from that from the city that can bring that in. And uh, you can send it to the whole delegation. I think we could really way to balance and where that would go because that's really got to help us. There's nothing, and we've all been there, what does the city think about this? And, you know, you've got to win it at that particular point in time. And if you don't have a contact person that is up to the contact, it would be nice to have the email for, beforehand and the research. And I understand the yeoman's work is going to be taken at two in this, you know what I mean? Like I say, if everybody writes two bills, there's 800 bills right there. So and that's not what's coming over from the Senate. The other thing, Mr. President, is the important thing is crossover time to pay particular the bills from the House will go over to the Senate, and we will now receive the Senate's version, which will be a whole different uh, format of bills, maybe new, uh, you know, stuff that we weren't really watching, you know, from the House side. So that'd be equally important there too. So. Okay. Is there anything else? Do I have a motion from one of the aldermen? Hold them adjourn. down. Motion, motion to adjourn. adjourn. Motion is to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And we're adjourned at 8.50. Beautiful.